this is me six months before I died. I don't look too good. Man, I miss life. The Rat Fink reunions, the weirdo fans. Heck, most of them weren't even born when I was customizing cars in the 50s. The 50s, man. <laughs> In your Chevrolet, America's asking you to call. Drive your Chevrolet through the USA. America's the greatest land of all. On a highway or a road along a levee. Performance is sweeter, nothing can beat her. Life is completer in a Chevy. So make a taste today. No offense to Dinah, but these Detroit heaps were pretty square. I always thought that cars could be cooler than that. Cars should have personalities, like be unique. This strip down forward is more than just a car. It's a collection of stories. How old are you anyway? Well, I came off the assembly line 77 years ago. Been rebuilt four times. First time was right after World War II. You see, after the war ended, the car factories in Detroit stopped building tanks and got back to building cars. Lots of them. That meant there were a whole lot of antiques like me that folks wanted to get rid of. People wanted new cars. They didn't want me. And then a bunch of crazy GIs back from working motor pools in Europe picked us up dirt cheap and Next thing I know, I'm going over 100 miles an hour on the dry lakes outside Los Angeles. Hi. How you doing? to go fast. They wanted rockets. Those boys were crazy. I grew up in Bell, California, a suburb of Los Angeles, which back then was the hot rotting capital of the world. Driving age was 14. Me and my buddies, all we wanted to do was build hot rods, like those guys out in the desert, and race them. Injection, compression, ignition, exhaust. Write that down. Uh, will that be on the exam, sir? We were outcasts, motorheads, flunking history, flunking geography. Personally, I flunked everything except auto shop and art.
Here I am with my first love, a sweet little three-window 32 coupe, which I completely rebuilt. Man, I was proud. I'd spend hours washing it and polishing it, and even talking to it. I love that car. The whole hot rod thing spread from teenager to teenager like jock itch. And pretty soon, everyone had a case of it. This is sad. I'm the only cool car left at Bob's Big Boy. I cannot believe cool cars. We'd come to the Big Boy. Fatso would stuff his face. Then he'd honk his horn. We'd pull out in formation, roll down a Ventura Boulevard, and we'd cruise. Hey, baby, nice headlight. Connie, you got any smokes? Here you go, Steve. Good to <laughs> Jimmy, where are you going? There's a party over in Reseda. Nah, me and Tina are going up to Paul Holland to watch the submarine race. guys got lucky in cars just like me. Oops, here comes Fatso. Time to cruise. was a long, flat stretch of After dark, when the workers had all left, we'd take our cars out there. We'd go head to head for cash, respect, or even ownership. Some nights were pretty hairy. You didn't know if you were gonna come home in one piece. and their hormones revving a little too high. It was a dangerous combination. Freezy, 
Rock Rotters. Let me through. She's dead, and she was pregnant. Oh my God, I killed the baby too. Hot rod cars have become a menace on our city streets. This city is going to stop contributing to national mass murder. Determined to make the streets safe for decent church-going Americans, the police started slapping tickets on every hot rod in sight. And it worked. Street racing was crushed like a kitten hit by a Cadillac. <laughs> So the fuzz kicked us off the streets. Fortunately, a friendly promoter in Orange County rented an old abandoned airfield, and we really started racing. As drag racing began to catch on, a few visionary individuals formed the National Hot Rod Association, or NHRA, to promote safe and responsible competition. Yeah, and they loaded me up with brochures and displays in those little pine tree deodorizers. Right. While my brother carried the deodorizers, I was outfitted with an ultra-high torque transmission and a special heavy-duty suspension so I could pull him behind me. You, you were the only one who's outfitted with high special stuff. I was, I, I was outfitted. Can we show the photo now? As this photo shows, Bud Coons and the NHRA family tuned me up and drove us from coast to coast where we worked with city officials and car clubs to establish strict standards of racing safety. You know, I got tuned. I got super tuned. Yeah, they put air in your tires. From California to Maine, the NHRA team inspected steering and brake systems, relegating unsafe cars to the sidelines. No detail was overlooked. Tire a little low. Dangerous street racing was eliminated, and organized drag racing became a legitimate multi-million dollar sport. The hot rod street racer was turned into the dragster, Oversized tires mounted on long metal rails supporting a massive supercharged engine. <laughs> Thus, through the efforts of a few dedicated individuals, the world became a safer place. Hey, hey. <laughs> can you do this? Huh? Huh? Can you do this? I don't want to do that. Can you drive to the grocery store? Do you have a steering wheel? Yeah, well, do, do, do you have a deodorizer?
Man, this chick is square even for the 50s. In fact, everything in this whole store is square. Easy, big boy. I can't believe my first job was at Sears. Dressing mannequins, setting up floor displays for a dollar an hour. Everybody trying to look exactly the same. What was I doing there? Well, I got married right out of high school and Sally was pregnant and I needed a job. But man, what I really loved was working on my latest car, the Roth. I'd come home from work, eat dinner, work on the Roth. It was around that time that I met this guy, Von Dutch. The first guy to put pinstriping on cars. Pinstriping had been used for years to highlight the contours of things like guns and horse-drawn carriages. But Von Dutch, he was an artist. His lines flowed like jazz. <laughs> As the car crowd got hip to what he was doing, guys from all over started bringing their cars to him to get dutched. Well, I was pretty handy with a paintbrush myself, so after work, I started jazzing up guys' cars at four bucks a pop. Before I knew it, I had more pinstriping jobs than I could handle. So I quit Sears and hooked up with an old guy named Bud the Baron Crozier, and we opened up a shop to do custom paint jobs. We custom painted anything that moved. Let me tell you something. If it wasn't for Roth, I wouldn't be the bodacious specimen you see before you. Hell yeah, Roth changed everything. With Roth, it wasn't about how fast you could go. It was about how cool you looked. It was about style. Roth had a way of painting flames that made a car look fast, even when it was standing still. <laughs> That meant a car like me didn't need to race. I could get all the attention I needed sitting in a parking lot. Before you knew it, high school parking lots all across California turned into show places for custom cars. Then came the car shows. They were like beauty pageants. The sexiest custom job drove away with the biggest trophy. Bottom line, a car like me was, is, and always will be a babe magnet. Oh yeah. Hey ladies, wanna sit on my hood? Maybe, uh, I should have rephrased that.
some of those outdoor activities you've been saving up for. Hey out there, Raider Land, you're listening to the best station in the city. Don't touch that. When I left Detroit, there were 15,000 cars that looked exactly like me. Mike here expressed his insanity by making me one of a kind. By the mid-50s, a whole industry grew up around guys wanting their cars to stand out from the crowd. There were magazines, Some accessories. Then the lid came off and guys started customizing everything. It's Dave's Home of Chrome. We've got muffler, manifold, mirrors, camshaft, carburetors, casings, rad cap, gas cap, gear shift, tailpipe, and the largest collection of hubcaps in Southern California. California. And don't forget Dave's custom electroplating. If you can carry it, we can chrome it. Dave's Home of Chrome. Chrome. Where the chrome roam. This week only. Lock nuts, six bucks for a set of four. for guys to get together and work on their cars. So right across the nation, they started forming car clubs. They had names like the Cruisers, the Shifters, the Strokers, the Gear Grinders. The most important piece of clothing for a guy in a car club was his club jacket. But in California, a lot of the time, it was too hot to wear your club jacket. So guys started coming to me to get their club name airbrushed on their t-shirts and sweatshirts. And for a laugh, I'd throw in a caricature of the guy in his car. Up until then, every t-shirt in the world was white, with nothing on them. No one had ever thought to customize what was basically underwear. I changed all that. I invented the t-shirt with a message. The customized t-shirt caught on right away. It let your average gearhead tell the world who he was on the inside.
just opened down the street for me. And everywhere you looked, kids were running around with those stupid mouse ears. I really hated that mouse. While waiting for a cheeseburger at my local Greasy Spoon, and I started sketching my version of a cartoon mouse on a napkin. Hairy, stinky, bulging, bloodshot eyes, saliva oozing, covered with flies, obnoxious. He was the anti-Mickey Mouse. I named him Ratfink, which was a phrase you heard on the Steve Allen Show. From Hollywood, it's the Steve Allen Show. Whenever I looked at Rat Fink, I felt like I was looking at my inner self. The world my parents, teachers, and responsible type people belonged to wasn't my world. Why did I have to be like them? I didn't. And somehow, Rat Fink helped me realize that. Yeah. Because I liked him so much, I copied him onto some shirts. The guys in the car clubs loved him. They got it. In the Edsel, the car that's truly new from nameplate to taillights. New from the front. New from the side. New from the rear. Only Edsel has the sleek, clean line design that sets it apart from the lookalike cars. It was 1960. Detroit was introducing what they thought were revolutionary new designs. In fact, they were going backwards. I had a completely different idea of where things should be headed. I was still building cars, and I was kind of like a mad scientist. Then one day, I discovered something that blew my mind. Fiberglass, capable of taking on any shape you can imagine for bathroom fixtures, patio furniture, even salad bowls. It was cheap. It was durable, and it was easy to shape. Up to now, I'd been taking Detroit's metal bodies, chopping them up a little and giving them cool paint jobs. But with fiberglass, I could create a car entirely from my imagination. I could sculpt a rod that looked like the ones I'd been drawing on T-shirts. A museum. I always figured I'd end up in a police auction. 
When he built me, Ed stole parts from every junkyard in Southern California. I have a 55 Caddy engine, the rear end of a 48 Ford, 58 Chevy tail lights, the windshield from a 27 Dodge, headlights from a 59 Rambler, motorcycle wheels up front, and the first ever all fiberglass body on a custom car. I wasn't a hot rod. I wasn't a race car. I was an outsider, an outlaw. My first year competing, I won top prize at every car show in North America. The other cars hated me, tried to have me banned from competition. They wanted to outlaw the outlaw. The latest in customized automobiles are featured in this year's Hot Rod and Custom Show. As you can see, much love and labor has gone into the creation of some very unique vehicles. The highlight of the show was the Outlaw, built by Ed Roth from California. This prize-winning roadster features a body made from a new material called fiberglass. You'd better believe it, folks. This Outlaw is wanted. <laughs> You know, after the outlaw arrived, guys like us were chopped liver. What do you care? You're still a Cadillac. When they call a vacuum cleaner a Cadillac, you know they're talking about the best. You think Elvis bought his mother a Volkswagen? He bought her a Cadillac. All I'm saying is people would pay attention to us. After that, they weren't looking. I mean, look at my headlights. I got eight of them. Look at my grill. All I'm saying is that after the outlaw arrived... Look at the chrome. Look at the chrome. Okay, okay, okay. You've got chrome. Thank you. Hey, Nebish, there's a smudge on my fender. Forward. There you go. <coughs> <laughs> While I was busy showing off the outlaw, over at the local corner store, young kids were getting hip to hot rods. One day, while I was shaving a new pattern into my sideburns, a rare and special occasion on its own, I got a phone call from a guy from Ravel Toys. He said that kids building model cars was big business. There were millions of kids out there who weren't old enough to drive the outlaw, but would want to build the outlaw. And you know something? He was right. The geniuses at Ravel told me they wanted me to become more of a character, something they could put on their model car boxes. So I thought about it for five seconds, and just like Bruce Wayne turned into Batman, 
Ed Roth became Ed Big Daddy Roth. Now, I had a new name, but I still dressed like a bum. Traveling on the road from car show to car show, I was in the habit of sleeping in my car. One morning, a 10-year-old kid saw me waking up, got disgusted, and wrote to Ravel complaining that I looked like a degenerate. That got Ravel a wardrobe that was a little more kid-friendly. So I went down to the Salvation Army, and for six bucks, I bought a getup that lent an air of elegance. How's it hanging, boys and girls? You know, I always love those monster movies. Oh man, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Frankenstein, Wolfman. So I began sketching my own monsters, and I put them in really cool hot rods. Hey, if I was a monster, that's what I'd be driving. When I put these designs on t-shirts, the kids thought they were a gas. Even though kids were kicked out of school for wearing them, my hot rod monster shirts became a national craze. Why are they ever neat? And look at the blood all over that one. I want the one with the three eyeballs. <laughs> well, let's get in there. <laughs> Once I started silk screening my weirdo characters onto t-shirts and sweatshirts, I was selling them by the truckload. So I moved into a bigger studio and hired some whacked out paint sniffers to me in the production line. In addition to guys like Fuller, I hired artists like Robert Williams to design ads in Hot Rod magazines. <laughs> Later on, he became a fine painter, selling his fine paintings for major coin.
Remember those guys racing in the desert? Well, some of them got so good at rocket propulsion that NASA hired them to help put a man in orbit. Everybody had space on the brain, so I figured, why not build a car that looked like a spaceship? Tourist daddy o they dig the bandit's hemispherical bubble top. Nobody'd ever put one on a car before. Big Daddy put some plastic in a pizza oven, then blew it up like a balloon while it was still hot. The cat was far out. If he was any farther out, he'd be out. <laughs> You see my joystick? It operates the steering, braking, acceleration, and transmission. The cubes in Detroit should have been kissing Big Daddy's hairy feet. For the final touch, he threw in a handful of shiny metal flakes into a pail of candy-colored paint and gave me 20 coats of the stuff. In the sun, it was so bright, it would knock out your eyeballs. Around this time, the world was starting to realize what guys in garages all over Southern California had known for years, that cars were art. Man, even soup cans and comic books had become art. An East Coast writer named Tom Wolfe called Big Daddy, and I quote, a surrealist in his designs, the Salvador Dali of the custom car movement. What I want to know is, what kind of car did this guy, Salvador Dali, ever build? Since coming up beside me is my owner, Tom Wolf. Wave to the people, Tom. Now I'm going to talk about Roth, so um, why don't you go get a cup of coffee or write a book or something? Roth was completely outside the contemporary art world, and yet when you see something like uh, the Beatnik Bandit, you know you're looking at a totally original work of art. Roth was inventing cars of a future that nobody but himself had ever even dreamed about, as if somewhere there was a surreal heaven that you would reach if you just let your imagination soar.
nowadays the Guggenheim can mount an exhibit of custom motorcycles and everybody goes, wow, that's great. But that could not have happened without Roth. Roth created that shift. This is where art's going. And the, the big paintings that are sitting in the art galleries now, they've got the big price tags on them, 50,000, 100,000, you've all seen them sold. What do they really mean? They don't really mean anything. They're hanging on a wall. And they're not groovy. But if you can apply that grooviness to what's happening now, that's where it's at. In other words, if you can create a thing like this, one, and it's a piece of artwork, a piece of sculpture, then that is a piece of contemporary art. Perfect. Just a couple more shots demeaning women on the other side, and we got it. Okay, it's a wrap. Thanks, everyone. Let me tell you about Big Daddy. Big Daddy was into hanging out at the beach. And he saw that on top of the car scene, there was this whole surf scene happening. And they were, like, connected. So he, like, started designing cars and monsters who dug the surf scene. The Beach Boys sang about little loose coops and driving Woody's to the beach. And suddenly songs about surfing and hot rodding were all over the airwaves. It was Surfing USA. So this one day, I'm getting a wax job when a limo pulls up to Big Daddy's garage and in walks this Hollywood producer who says that he wants to put me, the surfite, in a beach party movie. Tubular, man. So I say... And sure enough, I got this big scene with Annette. See? There's Annette. Frank. Yeah. And there's me. Hey, Annette, over here. What I don't get is, I was the one who was in the movie, but Big Daddy got to put the moves on Annette. Bummer. What can I tell you, dude? Big Daddy had that, that,
I took the money I made on the model royalties and put it into building my next car. Then Ravel put out a model of that one, too. Now I had money coming in from three models, and I was rolling. I tell you, man, those models were hard to put together. Every time I breathed in those glue fumes, I'd start to hallucinate. Maybe that's why the kids liked them so much. Then I had an inspiration. I took the monster design for my t-shirts and turned them into models. There was one monster I didn't have a name for, so Ravel held a contest to find one. The winner was a 12-year-old girl from New Jersey, Arlene Goldfarb. She named it Scuzzfink. Here's a letter I got from a kid in North Dakota. Dear Big Daddy, my whole life I felt like a weirdo but you made being a weirdo cool. Thank you. Kind of makes your eyeballs sweat, don't it? From here, the merchandising thing just exploded. I had my own comic book. Ed Ross Studios, two hole. Ed Ross Studios, one moment, please. And I even became a recording artiste. Mr. Gasser, take one. Mr. Gasser. Companies found if they put Rad Fink on their merchandise, some demented kid would blow his allowance on it. Go figure. Move over, Mr. Potato Head. Of Rat Fink merchandise in West Michigan. We've got decals, Halloween masks, keychains, lawn playing records, and more lawn playing records. We've got Rat Fink model kits, paint kits. Wheelie bars, skateboards, books, coloring books, hillbilly hats, and genuine rat pink rings. And of course, rat pink t shirts, monster sweats, or start your own car club with our rat pink car club jackets. Crazy Herald's Toy and Hobby Shop, 1223 Rock Ridge Road, just off Route 43, behind the bowling alley. It's a gas. I guess I wasn't the only one who was sick and tired of Mickey Mouse. of the early 60s was skateboarding. By now, I had five boys, and they loved rolling around on those little slabs of wood. 
so I built a custom skateboard just for them. Another 60s fad was the Whammo Frisbee. Playing Frisbee with my kids made me think about flying saucers. Up to this point, I'd been building cars that looked like they could fly. Now I decided to design one that actually could fly. by two Triumph motorcycle engines, this glass-body UFO hovers on a six-inch cushion of air. Built by the one and only Ed Big Daddy Roth, the Rotar will make its debut at the 10th annual Autorama at Cobo Hall. When I revved it up at an auto show in Detroit, a camshaft broke, shooting one of the propellers into the crowd and injuring five people. Well, hey. Nobody's perfect. like one minute custom car culture was at its peak and a minute later it had descended into stupidity of custom cars was over. lasts forever. For a while, teenagers dug cruising in cool cars and then moved on to the next big thing. They just moved on. Instead of the garage being a place where kids tuned up their cars, it became a place where they tuned their guitars. Okay, so after the whole scene had crashed, Detroit, 
finally got hip to the idea of building some cool cars. But the individualized stuff I was doing to cars, warping them, painting them, customizing them, didn't die. It spilled over into all kinds of things. Wow. the guys here grew up with Ed Roth, but now there's a whole new generation customizing cars. To them, Roth is Moses. He set them free and he showed them the way. And the man never stopped customizing. Thanks, Big Daddy. Thanks, Big Daddy. Ah, I'm dying here. Can you get off me? Looking around today, people have no idea how much of what they're seeing was influenced by Ed Roth. And Big Daddy Roth continues to be an inspiration to anyone rebelling against the Mickey Mouseness of everything around us. Hey folks, now's your chance to buy a Rat Fink t-shirt, signed by the master himself. Well, that's my story. But now it's time for me to get back to the garage. Some angels are waiting for me to customize their chariots. And I've got a special request to paint Rat Fink on a t-shirt for the big guy in the sky.
Remember, if you're driving home, keep the rubber side down and the shiny side up. Huh. <laughs> 